Good morning and welcome to the sixth annual Executive Branch Review Conference. It was six years ago uh, at the uh, press club, actually, that we hosted our first annual Executive Branch Review Conference with when we called it the first annual Executive Branch Review Conference. I was challenged on that a little bit, but I was confident that we would have a second and third and fourth and so forth. I didn't think we'd get to the sixth so fast, though. I don't know where the time goes. but um, We've got a fully packed day for you uh, today, so I'm going to be brief in my introductions. First, uh, thanks to the Federal Society's practice groups for helping organize today's event, and thanks also to the fine Federal Society staff who uh, too often go unrecognized in, in these circumstances. Uh, I also want to thank the Pacific Legal Foundation, a co-sponsor for this evening's closing reception, as it launches its Center for the Separation of Powers, and there's information about the center uh, outside. Uh, now it is my pleasure, well, first I want to acknowledge the odd configuration of the room we're in today, and um, this is not as we had envisioned it, but uh, we'll do our best to try and reconfigure things as we go throughout the day and, and make the best of it. Uh, sorry for any inconvenience, and I also want to welcome folks uh, who are watching the live stream as well. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our opening speaker, Naomi Rao, the administrator of what Washington insiders often call the most important agency that no one has ever heard of. And it's the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs within the OMB, the Office of Management and Budget. And I wonder what it says about the administrative state that one of its most powerful elements is so little known, at least uh, beyond Washington insiders. But it is good to have Naomi Rao at the helm, as her scholarship is informed by her work in all three branches of government. She began her illustrious and extensive career as an undergraduate at Yale University, where she graduated with highest distinctions. And she continued her education at the University of Chicago Law School. Following graduation, she clerked for Judge Wilkinson on the Fourth Circuit, and then Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. She's practiced law, and she specialized in arbitration in the United Kingdom. She served in the White House Counsel's Office, as a staffer on the Senate Judiciary Committee, and she served as Associate Counsel and Special Assistant to President George W. Bush. In 2006, she became an Assistant Professor at what is now the Antonin Scalia Law School, earning tenure in 2012. She's taught on structural constitutional law, administrative law, legislation, and statutory interpretation, and there, importantly, she founded the Center for Study of the Administrative State. This year, our Executive Branch Review Conference focuses on the current deregulatory landscape, and there's no better person to speak on this issue than the head of OIRA, Naomi Rao. <clears throat> thank you so much. Um, thank you to Dean and to the Federal Society for inviting me to discuss deregulation within the executive branch. I remember helping Dean organize the first executive branch review conference, and since that time, this event has only grown in importance. <clears throat> so as the administrator of OIRA, I am frequently introduced with a quip that, that Dean used as the head of the most powerful office you've never heard of. So in the past, I admit I've sort of understood this as a kind of compliment. But the more I hear it, um, I've started to wonder if people are highlighting the most powerful office part or the you've never heard of it part. Because <laughs> frankly, there are a lot of agencies you've never heard of. Um, although now I've been in this job for about nine months, and, and I've heard of a lot of these agencies. Um, in the past, what sounded like just a series of letters and noises now oddly makes sense to me. Take, for example, OFCCP, APHIS, GYPSA, NIMFS, FMCSA, and FIMSA, not to be confused with the statute, FISMA. Um, I think I now know what all of these acronyms stand for, and I admit I'm not sure if this is progress or just a casualty of being the head of the most powerful office you've never heard of. So, okay, but in all seriousness, um, this conference focuses on the deregulatory landscape, and indeed a few years ago that such a landscape would have been mostly barren. <clears throat> 
But in recent years, there's been an intellectual movement, as the Harvard Law Review has said, of anti-administrativists who have raised really fundamental questions about the administrative state. And now, indeed, regulatory reform has many proponents in Congress, the courts, and in particular, within the Trump administration. So in my remarks, I will discuss some of the administration's recent achievements and OIRA's role in implementation. The coordination, and centralized, the coordination of centralized regulatory review at OIRA is an essential component for ensuring the presidential direction of regulatory policy. Regulatory review within the executive office of the president furthers an important principle, which is unitary direction of the executive branch. It also serves across administrations to promote faithful execution of the laws through good regulatory practices. So what's been on the deregulatory landscape? So first of all, the president has made regulatory reform one of his very top priorities. He has issued executive orders to revisit and revise specific regulatory burdens involving energy and the environment, healthcare, labor, and tax. In addition, he has directed significant structural reform through an executive order that required the elimination of two regulations for each new one and imposed a zero regulatory budget for the first year of the administration. Now, at the end of fiscal year 17, across the government, we had really achieved some quite substantial success. Agencies managed a ratio of 22 to 1 deregulatory actions to significant regulatory actions. And these actions saved over $8 billion in regulatory costs. We've also slowed the imposition of costly new regulations and guidance documents and shifted away from the inertia that favors a steady expansion of the regulatory state. We've made tremendous progress in a short period of time. Now in this fiscal year, agencies project continuing to exceed the two for one ratio and to reduce regulatory costs even further as major deregulatory actions are completed. For the spring agenda, which should be out in May, we are focusing on deregulation in specific areas such as infrastructure reform and the promotion of new technology. These reforms have spurred economic growth and promoted innovation. Our policies are designed to create confidence that the government will not arbitrarily impose new burdens. And our efforts have returned to the American people a little more liberty to pursue their goals unfettered by unnecessary government interference. So what accounts for this turnaround? <clears throat> Historically, regulatory costs have increased steadily during administrations of both parties. And the fundamental direction that we've, the fundamental shift that we've seen has really been directed from the top. The president set a very clear agenda for reducing burdens at the start of his administration. And then the president appointed reform-minded agency heads, as well as close advisors throughout the White House, who promote this mission and work with agencies to set regulatory and deregulatory priorities. Against this background, let me explain the role of centralized regulatory review in implementing these priorities. OIRA is the central office for the federal government with respect to regulatory review. And as such, we have coordinated and driven the president's deregulatory efforts. Regulatory review is really a vehicle for setting and implementing regulatory policy across the government. It's no surprise that the last president who took deregulation seriously, President Ronald Reagan, created OIRA and cemented its role in this process. OIRA was essentially designed to oversee and provide checks on the rapidly expanding administrative state. And OIRA is part of the Office of Management and Budget, and as such, it operates within the Executive Office of the President. Our process is created through a series of executive orders, and these orders provide certain principles for review, and they provide a practical mechanism for, for, for directing and overseeing regulatory policy and change. Moreover, OIRA also has a kind of common law. We have a long-standing course of practice that has developed over nearly four decades. Agencies know that before issuing a significant regulation or guidance document, they must submit them to OIRA for review and approval. Other policy practices shift across administrations or even within administrations, but centralized regulatory review is a constant. It's a well-established mechanism for the review and control of regulatory policy. 
I want to say just a little bit about the process because I think it's relevant to how this process is used to, to direct and control regulatory policy. So the way things work, agencies provide us with advance notice of their regulatory actions. Agencies in the first instance designate whether a regulation is significant or economically significant, but OIRA makes the final determination about which rules are significant and should come in for review. Once a rule is in for review, it is shared with the relevant components of the Executive Office of the President, such as the National Economic Council, the Domestic Policy Council, White House Counsel's Office, and others. The regulation at that time is also sent to other agencies for an interagency review. So you can see that this is a very important step for presidential direction and control of regulatory policy. A WIRA review is really, in effect, White House and interagency review. The president's senior advisors have the opportunity to weigh in on regulatory policy, and it's an essential mechanism for bringing regulatory issues into the White House it's not, of course, the only one, but it's one of the few formalized procedures. And in this way, um, a WIRA review can promote a more unitary executive. It creates stronger political accountability for regulatory actions, and it promotes essential constitutional checks. Centralized review really allows for a more consistent regulatory policy across the government. And it gives us a way to resolve conflicting priorities and policies. This process also can check agency myopia and capture. Because agencies are very intently focused on their missions, they might miss other important issues or competing priorities across the administration. Now, I'm aware that agencies sometimes bristle against the process of OIRA review, but it's very important that policy discretion be exercised by accountable officials. Now, that, of course, includes, in the first instance, political appointees at agencies who have primary responsibility for regulatory policy. But agencies must report up through the chain of command to the president. And so our review promotes a kind of unitariness through coherence and consistency of regulatory policy across agencies. A WIRA review also promotes institutional best practices for the exercise of executive power with respect to regulatory policy. While policy preferences change across administration, OIRA has developed long-standing good practices that have helped to ensure that the president is taking care of faithful execution of the laws. We first, in our review, ensure that regulatory actions are consistent with law and that agencies have authority for their actions. In this administration, we encourage agencies to follow the best interpretation of the statute, not just an interpretation that might receive deference in court. We want to make sure that agencies are respecting the lawmaking power of Congress by staying within their statutory authority. Regulations also have to meet standards of cost-benefit analysis in which the benefits must substantially exceed the costs. We require agencies to consider regulatory alternatives to ensure that they are imposing the least possible burdens on the public. So we really want responsible, careful regulatory analysis for both regulatory and our deregulatory actions. And within this broader framework, OIRA can also further specific administration priorities. Um, this administration, as I've said, has been particularly focused on the reduction of accumulated burdens, the problems that regulations have just piled on top of regulations. And OIRA addresses these problems in three ways. First, we're undertaking the kind of practical work of deregulation. Second, we press a very principled and consistent message of reform. And third, we are pursuing structural changes that can strengthen centralized review and presidential control. So first on the practical side, um, how do we, you know, we're actually implementing regulatory reform and the president's executive orders. We are using the annual unified agenda of regulatory and deregulatory actions to drive change. The agenda is a long-standing publication in which agencies forecast the actions they are planning for the coming year. It's a very important tool to give the public advance notice of what's coming down the pipeline. And in reviewing proposed agency agendas, OIRA can evaluate how an agency is progressing in meeting the president's priorities on specific issues and also with respect to reducing unnecessary regulatory burdens. Another example of our practical work is related to the regulatory budget. 
Um, as I've mentioned, the president imposed, really for the first time, a kind of regulatory budget by directing agencies to have zero regulatory costs for fiscal year 17. Now, this was a very ambitious goal, which we actually exceeded. But OIRA worked closely with agencies to measure these cost allocations. And we issued guidance to agencies on the process for setting cost allocations and how they would be banked across years. And we told agencies that we expected their cost allegations to be zero or less than zero for this fiscal year. So that's some of the practical things we work on. Um, but second, we're promoting a principled and consistent message of reform. You know, for us, eliminating an unnecessary regulatory burdens has a very principled foundation. We're focused foremost on individual liberty. We believe in regulatory reform because it gives people more freedom to work hard and exercise ingenuity, which in turn results in economic growth and technological development. We are also emphasizing and reinforcing principles and requirements of fair notice and due process. We want to ensure that agencies are following the proper regulatory procedures and that agencies are not using sub-regulatory guidance as a backdoor to policymaking. Finally, we are advancing the administration's regulatory reform priorities by pursuing structural changes that strengthen centralized review, democratic accountability, and the role of cost-benefit analysis. Last week, for example, we advanced these structural principles by entering into a new agreement with the Department of Treasury that will allow tax regulatory actions to be reviewed by OIRA under its normal terms. I mean, tax regulations, you may not know, were largely exempt from the OIRA review process under a 35-year-old memorandum of agreement. In the last few years, Congress and the GAO have called on Treasury and OMB to reconsider that MOA. And President Trump last spring issued an executive order that focused on reducing regulatory tax burdens and directed OMB and Treasury to reconsider the old MOA. We have done so and recently announced a framework for the review of tax regulations. The basic structure follows the regular OIRA centralized review process. However, we have provided for shorter time frames for review, particularly for certain tax reform rules. And we've also included provisions that account for the unique revenue-raising function of Treasury. But beyond the specifics, this new MOA recognizes the importance of the principle of centralized regulatory review, even in a context such as tax. These broader principles could also be extended to the traditionally understood independent agencies. The Supreme Court has repeatedly emphasized that such agencies are within the executive branch. Many of them issue generally applicable regulations that would benefit from centralized review. Such review would ensure consistency with law and maximize benefits to the public. Moreover, these agencies already work with OIRA to comply with the Congressional Review Act, the Paperwork Reduction Act, and other statutes. Such agencies also participate in the annual unified agenda of regulatory and deregulatory actions. In the past, independent agencies have consulted with OIRA to improve their economic analysis. So really, OIRA review can promote a more constitutional and coherent regulatory policy. Good regulatory practices promoted by OIRA can apply to all agencies that regulate the public. This is a principle long held by scholars of different perspectives, the American Bar Association, and the Administrative Conference of the United States. So for us, the continued success of reform will require the commitment and hard work of many executive branch officials to the practical, principled, and structural components of reform. And just on a final note, um, we should not lose sight of the fact that the deregulatory landscape involves more than just the executive branch. There are very important roles here for Congress and the courts. Each branch needs to exercise its respective constitutional powers. But I think those are topics for another time. Thank you very much for your attention. We have time for a few questions. Um, if folks want to use the microphones in the aisles. Uh. Thank you very much for being here. Wayne Abernathy from the American Bankers Association. You talked about using the authorities of IR to try to get around this practice that regulators use to get around the APA by using guidance. 
-hmm. instead of regulations. We see now Congress is getting very serious about that by today, they're gonna have a vote in the Senate on guidance as if it were regulation according to a JO report. Would you expand upon how OIRA is getting at that problem? Sure, um, yeah, thank you for that question. <clears throat> um, so OIRA, um, formally reviews or can review significant guidance documents from the agencies. So if um, a guidance document has, is economically significant, although I have to be honest, I've not quite understood what's in the category of economically significant guidance. If a guidance document is imposing more than $100 million in costs, I'm not sure why it's a guidance document. But there is such a category of economically significant guidance. and. Um, other times, guidance may be significant because it raises important policy issues, and those can be reviewed by OIRA. Um, I think one of the things that we really push back on agencies is when they give us a, a significant guidance document or let us know that something is coming down the pike, we look very carefully to make sure that the guidance document is, is really guidance. You know, we want to make sure that it's not imposing any new legal obligations on the public. And if it seems as though the guidance document is imposing new obligations, then we send it back to the agency to start a rulemaking process. Um, and so we have had a number of instances where something has come in as a guidance document, but it's eventually gone out as a notice of proposed rulemaking. And I think by doing this repeatedly, we're encouraging this principle that guidance um, needs to stay within its proper role, which is simply to explain existing legal obligations. Mm -hmm. Uh, hi there. My name's Nick Klesis, and for years I worked with the U.S. Agency for International Development on Trade Capacity Building and Commercial Law Reform Abroad. And I just wanted to comment that um, um, thanks to many people from OIRA that volunteered their time, or the agency volunteered their time, uh, they've been very helpful in uh, helping us uh, open up markets in other countries by also exposing, you know, governments and bureaucrats in those countries, the uh, cost-benefit principles, fair notice and comment, real regulatory impact uh, assessments. So uh, this is really important work. It's part of um, the joint strategic framework between USAID and the State Department to help mm -hmm. open up markets uh, abroad and open up job opportunities in this country. So uh, anyway, I hope uh, the work keeps on going on abroad too and we keep an eye on uh, things abroad. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for that comment. Um, it is actually an interesting part of the OIRA process that we do work with um, issues of international regulatory cooperation. We work very closely with Canada and other countries. Um, you know, just in the short time that I've been at OIRA, a number of countries have come to us asking us about good regulatory practices and how they can be implemented in their countries. And we are, um, we are very, you know, eager and willing to help other countries that are interested in promoting these practices. Hi, my name is Maxine. I'm a reporter for e and &E News. And uh, you mentioned that we can expect the Spring Unified Agenda to come out in May and to focus on infrastructure reform. I was wondering if you could say any more just for reporters who are eager and curious. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're hoping that the, that the agenda will be out sometime in May. Um, we're on target to do that, at least right now. Um, but I think you'll have to wait and see, see what's in there, because we're still finalizing entries. But there'll be a, a full rollout in May. Steve Williams, could you give your views on the idea that uh, OIRA should publish critiques of proposed rules with those critiques being subject to the usual review under State Farm? Thank you, Judge. I can already um, see arguments pro and con, but I want um, Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting. People have, have asked about, you know, sh should we reveal the back and forth you know, the past back that goes on between OIRA and the agencies. Um, and I guess, you know, I think that would be difficult for the deliberative process. I think one of the reasons that we're able to be effective is that there is, um, you know, deliberative protection for the interaction between OIRA and the agencies. But I would say that our process is in many ways much more transparent than other processes within the executive branch because, um, once a rule is concluded, you know, a member of the public can ask for the rule as it was initially submitted and also see, of course, the final rule. And you can kind of compare those two things and, you know, assume that something has happened in the interim. So, so I think that's at least some, some important measure of transparency that we provide. We've got a couple minutes left. I'll ask, oh, go ahead, Bob. Hey, Robert Barker. Uh, one question, I'm just curious as to what your role is in treaty negotiations, the, the renewed emphasis on maybe looking at TPP again, 
which puts our labor and environmental policies sort of up to grab for a, an international tribunal might undermine the work of OIRA. So I'm just wondering if you're looking at that or if you ever look at treaty. Yeah, thank you. Um, so OIRA is, um, you know, we are of course not the lead on, on treaty negotiations, but many of these treaties, as you've mentioned, raise regulatory issues, either on specific topics or with respect to good regulatory practices generally. And um, so OIRA is involved with those negotiations. OIRA sent um, people down to the NAFTA negotiations with respect to the good regulatory practices chapter. And I know in the past, we've been involved with TPP and other, other trade agreements. So we do, play, we do play a role in those. Good morning, Joe Martiak with the New Civil Liberties Alliance. My question is about independent agencies. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit more about how that exchange works between the, the agencies that are supposedly independent and yet mm -hmm. should be tied in more with uh, OMB? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, currently, um, independent agencies are not subject to centralized regulatory review. Um, however, OIRA does interact with independent agencies, um, as I mentioned, in a number of different ways. So, for instance, under the Congressional Review Act, independent agencies, like other agencies, have to submit their rules to OIRA for a major determination under the, under the CRA to see whether it was worth more than $100 million. We review all of their paperwork collections and information collections, which are, of course, sometimes an important aspect of regulatory policy. Um, and we review their agenda items so we have a sense of you know, what they have planned in the coming year. Um, the, you know, as to the broader question um, of centralized regulatory review at OIRA for independent agencies, I mean, that's something that has been considered since the Reagan administration, and, and it's a question that we, we continue to, to consider. Well, thank you, Administrator Rao. We certainly appreciate you setting the table for us today. Thanks for having me.